Let's take a look at how to use blood products. There's an introduction to some of the blood products and the microcytic anemias. So the blood products, each unit of packed cells, a unit of packed red blood cells, each unit of packed red blood cells should be able to increase the hematocrit and increase the hemoglobin by how many points? So a unit of packed red blood cells. So you donate blood and you donate 500 mLs of blood. Now that 500 milliliter of blood donation becomes down to, you make 150 milliliters of it is fresh frozen plasma, which in fact is discarded most of the time because we use a lot more pack cell transfusions than we do fresh frozen plasma. People don't need the volume. It's a byproduct, you might say. And the other 350 milliliters of it becomes the packed cells. Now, since you're removing most of the juice, most of the liquid, most of the broth with this blood sauce, the unit of packed red blood cells actually has a hematocrit that's about 70 to 80. <clears throat> because what you have is you've taken out all the plasma. So since you've taken out all the plasma, it means that there's a very high concentration, a very high hematocrit of units of packed cells. That's why it's called packed cells. Now you might say, well, why not just leave all the fresh frozen plasma? Why not leave the plasma in there? And the answer is two things. When people need blood transfusions, mostly what they need is the oxygen carrying capacity of the hemoglobin. Remember 1.34 milliliters of oxygen for each gram of hemoglobin? Ooh, that isn't in the complex one, step one part of your brain, isn't it? So you should be able to have an increase in the hematocrit by that unit of pack cells. Each unit of pack cells should be able to get you about three points up in the hematocrit, which is the same thing as about one point up in the hemoglobin. That's what you should be getting out of pack cells. Fresh frozen plasma is when you have a coagulopathy. Fresh frozen plasma should be said that it has all the clotting factors except it does not have too much in the way of von Willebrand's factor. It does not have too much in the way of factor eight or nine. <clears throat> so when you need factor eight and nine replacement for a hemophiliac, you replace specific factor eight and nine with recombinant technology. In other words, you get an E. coli and you put a plasmid, a little frisbee of circular DNA, into that, into that E. coli, and you get the E. coli to make factor eight and factor nine for the hemophilia A and hemophilia B. You can get that thing to play with a violin if you get enough plasmids put into the E. coli correctly. And von Willebrand's factor, we end up giving, by giving desmopressin, causes the release of subendothelial stores, releases the stores of it. It's kind of like uh, platelet Viagra. Uh, and if that doesn't work, or one shot is not enough, you give it with factor eight, because factor eight and von Willebrand factor travel with each other. So fresh frozen plasma is for all the clotting factors except factor eight, nine, and von Willebrand's factor. And when we say factor eight and von Willebrand's factor, they tend to be a little bit interchangeable because they travel attached to each other. Well, we don't use too much cryoprecipitate because cryoprecipitate is a pooled blood product. You're taking a lot of fresh frozen plasma and by freezing it, what you're doing is precipitating out about 50% of the clotting factors that were in that fresh frozen plasma, but it goes into only 10% 50% of the clotting factors into about 10% of the volume. It's a way of giving a ton of clotting factors in a much smaller volume. So when you have a big coagulopathy like disseminated intravascular coagulation, one of the great misnomers in life, isn't it DIC? Doesn't cause coagulation, it causes bleeding. A lupus anticoagulant makes you clot, and disseminated intravascular coagulation makes you bleed. How odd is that? Cryoprecipitate is never the first answer for any disease, anytime, anywhere. So when the question says, what is the best initial therapy? The answer is never cryoprecipitate. So when the question says, what is the best initial therapy? The answer is never cryoprecipitate. It's an add-on mostly to give 
fibrinogen. That's one of the things that cryoprecipitate can be used to give in high volume. See, what one things we don't realize is, is that when you have a person who's bleeding to death with DIC in the intensive care unit, and you need to give the equivalent of 10 and 20 units of fresh frozen plasma, the person will just float away. Now, there are other things that try and inhibit uh, coagulation, tranexamic acid to try and inhibit, coag uh, inhibit uh, uh, fibrinolysis, okay? But it doesn't work out so well. They're not to the standard transexamic acid or the other forms of clotting factors. So you have to be able to just say this, factor eight and nine is replaced with specific factor eight and nine replacement. Pack cells is in general what you use every time you're anemic. And you, this is the expected rise. And that's an important number because if you give somebody three units of PAC cells, but their hem hematocrit only raises one point, you know, oh, you must still be bleeding a lot. Okay, so tranexamic acid and another thing called amino caproic acid, these are rarely used things that are meant to in inhibit fibrinolysis, uh, fibrinolysis. And that's what you, all you have to do is you have to say that this is a occasional use in people who are bleeding and you can't control that bleeding, not too often. Is there a specific factor 10 replacement? No. Specific factor 2 replacement, not meaningfully. The specific clotting factors that we do have in recombinant technology is factors 8 and 9 and 7, actually, can be used as specific factor replacements. There's your intro to blood products. Now, the chances of transmitting disease is about 1 in 50,000 hepatitis B, 1 in 50,000 hepatitis C. But the hepatitis C thing, what's very important is to know the actual year that the hepatitis C test came out. You see, prior to 1988, there was no hepatitis C test. We used to call it non-A, non-B. It's not A, it's not B, I don't know why it's bad. And that was when the hepatitis C test came out. Now, I can understand if a number of you say, oh, I wasn't even born in that year. We ain't telling this ancient history story or, you know, game of clotting factors. We ain't telling you ancient lost worlds. That's a long time ago, right? Well, the reason why that's important is how long does it take for hepatitis C to cause cirrhosis? It takes hepatitis C 25 to 30 years. And that's why who should be screened for hepatitis C? You're gonna get this question. I'm telling you, this is what I would ask if I was writing the test. This is what I'd write. It's not cheating, it's just an educational priority. What's the most common reason to need a liver transplant in the United States? Hepatitis C, not alcohol. Four million people living with chronic hepatitis C. And now we can cure it. Yes, the big cure, cure, cure. Like four letter word, cure. It's like the big love. 95% with let it pass fear and sofosbuvir and the other protease inhibitors. So this is a big tested subject here because it's logical. You can do something about it and it's a lot better than a quarter million dollar liver transplant. See, that's why the people who are born between the years 1945 and 1965 should be screened. And the concept of testing people according to risk factors is gone. It was a mistake. It is bakwas, mierda de vaca, sabakwas, sabakwas. Because what we see is these people got their transfusions when? Oh, 1960, 1970, 1980. There's just a five times rate of risk. And you should test for hepatitis C regardless of risk factors. So the question will say to you, which of the following people should be tested? Uh, if you had a history of injection drug use, promiscuity, multiple sexual partners, prisoners, and the answer is supposed to be everybody born between these years automatically and those other risk factors too, but even with no risk factors. That's because 40% of people with chronic hepatitis C had no risk factors. <gasps> yeah.
So, and you can do something about it. All right, now let's go on to the most common cause of anemia there is, which is microcytic, an MCV that's less than 80. Microcytic anemias. Now, you can't tell them apart based on symptoms. They all make you tired, they all make you fatigued, they all make you short of breath when it's really, really bad. They can all give you chest pain, they can all cause syncope if they're severe enough. They all ultimately can result in a myocardial infarction with a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity to the heart. So it's not the etiology that gives the symptoms, it's based on the severity. See, you already know that one. It's not the etiology, it's based on the severity. It's not the etiology, it's based on the severity. So that's why hematology is laboratory day. That's why we said it's laboratory day, because there is no unique physical finding to tell you which one you have. And if you're thinking about thalassemia major and being told about tower skulls and chipmunk faces, this is just nonsense. Nobody has those things. You'd have to leave the child untreated for years to have those symptoms non-existent. Now, you might have a history of a chronic disease, and that's understandable because there's nothing that's as associated with the anemia of chronic disease as a chronic disease. Or you have some sort of history of increased loss of blood. You only need one milligram per day of iron. You only need one milligram a day of iron. That's if you're a non-menstruating man. Now, if you're menstruating, a menstrual under, under age 50 for ladies, is that you need, on average, two milligrams a day, two to three milligrams a day. If you're pregnant, you need five or six. Now the maximum you can absorb, the maximum you can absorb is only three or four milligrams a day. Now iron regulation is very tightly controlled. Where? Where? Controlled by hepcidin. Hepcidin, that's what's mutated in hemochromatosis. Hepcidin is mutated in hemochromatosis. Hepcidin regulates the amount of iron absorbed in your duodenum. And it's very tightly regulated because you don't have that much of a range. See, if this was the urine, urine, man. Oh, I can have an osmolality as low as 50 or an osmolality at 1,200. I can have my urine sodium B10. I can have my urine sodium B200. Oh, there's a huge range in the kidney. The kidney, comparatively speaking, is a much more intelligent organ. But the duodenum can only regulate it between one milligram and three or four milligrams. This is why pregnant women who need five always become anemic. One, they can't absorb enough. Number two, how does the pregnant lady increase her plasma volume? The pregnant lady increases the plasma volume by increasing ADH. So all pregnant ladies become anemic because one, they can't absorb enough. Number two, they increase their ADH. Now, when you have an increased loss, ooh, remember how we said here that a unit of PAC cells should raise the hematocrit by three points? That's because inside the unit of PAC cells, inside the unit of packed red blood cells. Each milliliter of packed cells has one milligram of iron. Has one milligram. And remember, which one do we have in us? Do we have the fat ik or the fat us? What's inside us? What's inside us is the fat us. Which is the iron in us? Fair S. Which is the iron that make you sick? Fair ick. Fair ick make you sick. Icky. Fair ick is sick. Fair us in us. Hiya. So it means that if you take a unit of pack cells, which is 350 milliliters, that's 350 milligrams of iron. 350 milligrams of iron per unit of packed cells. Now do you understand 
why if you only need one milligram a day, why it's very easy to become iron overloaded if you get transfused every two weeks. Ooh, myelodysplastic syndrome, my marrow sucks. I'm getting transfused once or twice a month. Once or twice a month, I'm getting a year's worth of iron. Ooh, myelofibrosis, I'm getting transfused once or twice a month. Once or twice a month, I'm getting a year's worth of iron. I have aplastic anemia. Mm, that either gets better or you die, but you know, you might be getting transfused a bunch. Over transfusion, now you can see where you get the iron overload. After all, how do you excrete extra iron from the body normally? Show me how you excrete your iron. What's your extra way to excrete? What if you're getting transfused and you needed to get rid of the iron and excrete iron? How would you do that? You ever thought about it? And yeah, the long answer that people go is they say, well, your menstruation. Well, great, thank you very much. I'll just start menstruating. Well, that's not happening. You see, there is no way to just increase iron excretion from the body. You have to lose cells. You have to shed skin. You have to shed GI epithelial cells. See, half the volume of stool is GI epithelial cells. That's why even when you stop eating, you don't stop having bowel movements. Even when you stop eating, you don't stop having bowel movements because every five days, your small bowel changes its entire epithelial lining. Every five days, it changes its entire epithelial lining. So that's why it is that if you get transfused a lot, you are going to get iron overloaded. That's why the occasional person who has beta thalassemia major or people who have alpha thalassemia, the big one, the worst one, and get transfused all the time, there's no way to increase iron excretion. Ooh, by the way, how do you die of hemochromatosis? How do you die of hemochromatosis? If you just said heart disease, that is the most common wrong answer. If you just said cardiomyopathy, that is the most common wrong answer. So hemochromatosis kills you from liver disease 80% of the time. Cardiac is only 15% of the time. The rest is miscellaneous things like diabetes. <clears throat> so if you are over transfused, we just said that there's no way to increase iron excretion from the body. If you are over transfused, over transfused into hemochromatosis, you have to get rid of that iron before you develop cirrhosis. Because once you develop cirrhosis, what can you do to manage people? Cremation, above ground burial, taxidermy, you can't do anything about it. So how do you manage that iron overload of hemochromatosis from overtransfusion? The most common wrong answer is to say phlebotomy. You can't do phlebotomy on people you're transfusing every two weeks. You can't do phlebotomy on them. You gave them blood. You can't be like, come Monday for a transfusion. Now Wednesday, come for a phlebotomy. Now Thursday, come for transfusion. Now Friday, come for a phlebotomy. On Monday, we'll give you a transfusion in this arm, and we'll do a phlebotomy in that one. So you can't do phlebotomy when it's over transfusion. Phlebotomy is for hemochromatosis for people whose duodenum has a defective hepcidin gene. What you do is deferocirox, deferoprone. Why are deferocirox and deferoprone, why are these different than deferoxamine? What's different about deferocirox, deferoprone? 
um, deferoxamine. What's different? The answer is very straightforward. Deferoserox and deferoprone are oral. And remember that your test tests the route of administration subcutaneous, not the dose. It tests the route of administration, but not the dosing. So this question about you knowing phlebotomy is the wrong answer for overtransfusion and deferoserox and deferoprone are oral, that's a big question. And you know, the one about knowing that these are the oral meds, if you did in fact know that, you should consider yourself in the top 10 to 15%. Because medical students and residents don't know about this because it's in a little niche somewhere that they never quite get to. And besides that, there are far more people who have hemochromatosis from defective genetics and familial and uh, mutations than there are from over-transfusion. Beta thalassemia, alpha thalassemia major is rare. And older people who get over-transfused from mild dysplasia, myelofibrosis, are usually in their 60s and 70s, and they die before they get iron overloaded. So it's a rare disease. So if you do those, you should feel proud of yourself. Now the other thing is, you also have to view the course that you're watching now as something that clues you into stuff that you got to go look up. Now one of the occupational hazards of being Conrad Fisher is that people look at me and they watch and they go, man, you are so exciting, I'm never going to forget this because I am memorable. That's true, except for the fact it will fade. You see, what will happen is that after a couple of weeks, if you don't go look this up, or even a couple of days, it decays and has a half-life. You gotta go look up deferoserox and deferoprone. Most people don't know that. And if you got that answer wrong about saying heart disease was the most common cause of death, you gotta go wake up and go, you know, go, go smell the book. You see, it's like, if you don't reinforce it, it fades. It's like two weeks after an Indian wedding. I don't see any tattoos. Mm, but they were there. I had them in the palm of my hand. What happened? They faded away. They faded away. So that's why you have to go look it up because other than that, it fades. So iron deficiency anemia, you only need to lose. You only need to lose one teaspoon of blood. A teaspoon of blood which is about five milliliters, which is about five milligrams of blood, of hemoglobin, of iron, you only need to lose one teaspoon of blood a day in your GI tract for you to become iron deficient. Now you know why it's the most common presentation of colon cancer when it does present. Matter of fact, unexplained microcytic anemia above age 50 Microcytic anemia above age 50 is colon cancer because you're not going to see that. I just told you, you can only absorb four. And if you lose one teaspoon a day, you won't see it, but it will make you anemic over time. Now, the anemia of chronic disease, look for a chronic disease. And what is the most common cause of sideroblastic anemia? What's the most common cause of a sideroblastic anemia? The most common cause of sideroblastic anemia is not lead poisoning. It is not lead poisoning. It is not isoniazid. It is not vitamin B6 deficiency. The most common cause of sideroblastic anemia is the alcohol. Alcohol. The alcohol. That's right. You see, there's no mojito made of lead. There's no lead in tonic. My goodness, I think I'll have a mango flavored lead margarita. There's a lot more alcohol than there is lead running around the world. So alcohol by far is the most common cause of sideroblastic anemia. Any chronic disease, any cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, HIV, infection, chronic infection, end stage renal disease. Now that's the only one that gets erythropoietin. People who are on dialysis with end-stage renal disease is the only one that gets erythropoietin because it's the only one that has an effect because unless you're actually erythropoietin deficient, erythropoietin will not work on the anemia of chronic disease. Erythropoietin will not work on the anemia that is from rheumatoid arthritis and chronic inflammatory conditions and cancers. 
It has to be only if there is end-stage renal disease. So what do you think they're going to do? You think they're going to ask you a question about treatment? How do you treat iron deficiency? Give them some iron. How do you treat the anemia chronic disease? Fix the disease. How do you treat the anemia sideroblastic anemia? Slap that vodka out of your mouth. How do you treat thalassemia? Go back in time and prevent your grandparents from having sex. How do you treat it? It's a genetic disorder. So the questions for you are going to be lab testing. Lab testing. So here, yes, low iron in iron deficiency. But then again, anemia of chronic disease also has a low iron too. As a matter of fact, they all have a, oh, here starts the questions. Which of the following has a low ferritin? Which of the following has a high platelet count? Which of the following is automatically has a high iron level? Which of the following has a low ferritin? Which of the following has a high platelet count? Which of the following is associated with an increased RDW, red cell distribution of width? Which of the following is associated with increased RDW, red cell distribution of width? Oh, yes. Which one is diagnosed on bone marrow? Only iron deficiency. I didn't say I'd do the bone marrow. I didn't say I'd do the bone marrow, but it is the single most sensitive test. <clears throat> and sometimes that's one of the problems on your test. Is the question says, what is the most accurate? And your mind hears it as, what would you do? I never said I'd do the bone marrow, but it is the most accurate. What is the only one of these that has a high circulating iron? Oh, the only one of these that has a high circulating iron is sideroblastic. That's the only one that has a high circulating iron. What is different? What's unique? What is the only one that has a low ferritin? Iron deficiency anemia, low storage form. What is different? What's unique? What is different? What's unique? What gives me the answers that I seek? Now, the problem with ferritin, ferritin is an acute phase reactive, like we said in Stills disease and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So since ferritin is an acute phase reactant, people who have chronic infections and inflammations and other illnesses can have an artificially normal ferritin with iron deficiency. If they have iron deficiency, from some other disorder. Iron deficiency and cancer. Iron deficiency and an infection. So 30% of people will have a normal ferritin. The same way 30% of people who are B12 deficient will have a normal B12 level. 30% of people who are B12 deficient have a normal B12 level. Mmm. So what do we do then? That's where the iron binding capacity goes in. The total iron binding capacity goes up. You see, the total iron binding capacity is a measure of the open, unoccupied, unfilled sites on transparent. The iron binding capacity is the number of open seats. If every seat in the room is filled, there's no capacity. This is empty, so you have a high capacity. And that's how part of the way you'll tell it apart from people who have chronic disease because the total iron capacity is down because they're packed with iron. They are packed with iron. They just can't do anything with it. Which of these is associated with a high platelet count? Iron deficiency. Iron deficiency gives a high platelet count because it turns out that erythropoietin and thrombopoietin, erythropoietin and thrombopoietin have some overlap chemically. So when you have the anemia, then you have iron deficiency and your erythropoietin goes up, it stimulates some of the megakaryocytes. Which of these is associated with hemoglobin H? Hemoglobin H. What is hemoglobin H? Hemoglobin H is in thalassemia. 
Hemoglobin H is that on the electrophoresis, which is the only hard question <coughs> for thalassemia, because in thalassemia, it's microcytic anemia, microcytic anemia plus normal iron studies. And a microcytic anemia and normal iron studies is thalassemia. Microcytic anemia and normal iron studies is thalassemia. There you go. Microcytic anemia. Very small cells. Which of these can have target cells? Does target cells help us? Which of those has target cells? They all have target cells. Now, target cells may be most often in thalassemia because a target cell is a cell with a lot of extra membrane. A target cell is the extra membrane bunches up so it looks like a target because it's like a size 2 cell wearing a size 16 membrane. It sort of bunches up. It's like your mother is still buying your clothes, buying them too large for you because she's expecting you to grow into them. So all of these could have tha target cells. Thalassemia just has them the most often. Thalassemia just has them the most often. So hemoglobin H is on electrophoresis. When you have alpha thalassemia and beta thalassemia, and you have alpha thalassemia, and you're missing one gene, you don't feel that. That's normal. This person has no symptoms. When you have four gene deleted, you don't feel that either. One gene deleted, they don't show up. They don't call you. They don't page you at 3 o'clock in the morning. They don't show up late to clinic because... They what? They're silent. means 100% normal. Four gene deleted. They don't show up either. They don't page you. They don't show up late for their clinic appointments either because four gene deleted is dead. That's Bart's hemoglobin. Bart's. Bart, Bart. That's gamma four tetrads. Bart's hemoglobin is gamma four tetrads. So one gene deleted is normal. Four gene deleted is dead. So really we worry about two and three gene deleted. So this is a bit of an irritation. This is one of those things I was saying that you're not gonna just get this by looking at this once, especially here in the electrophoresis story. Normal hemoglobin is made up of two alpha chains and two beta chains. And if you don't have alpha chains because your alpha genes are deleted, you start to get beta-4 tetrads because you've got all these extra beta chains building up and now all those extra beta chains are called hemoglobin H when you have beta-4 chains building up, jumping on each other. Four gene deleted, you're dead. Bart's hemoglobin. Gamma-4 tetrads in utero, that's fetal hemoglobin. Three gene deleted, I'm missing almost all my, I'm missing almost all my alpha chains, I'm missing almost all my alpha chains, and you get beta-4 tetrads. Who's got hemoglobin H? Which of these is the only one that has a high RDW, red cell distribution of width? The answer is iron deficiency. Iron deficiency gives it a high red cell distribution of width because the cells are of different sizes. I get a high red cell distribution of width because the cells are of different sizes in iron deficiency anemia. Ready to be wrong? Let's be wrong. In iron deficiency, are the new cells bigger or are the new cells smaller in iron deficiency? Not in a normal person, but in iron deficiency. In iron deficiency, the new cells are smaller because you're running out of iron. And as you run out of iron, you make smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller cells. You're running out of food, you make smaller sandwiches. You're running out of food, smaller pierogi, smaller empanadas, smaller pakoras. 
Because as you're running out of iron, you make smaller and smaller cells. So you're going to study like this and say, which is the only one that has? Which is the only one that has? Which is the only one that has a high circulating iron sideroblastic? Which is the only one that has Prussian blue staining? Prussian blue staining, which is the only one that has Prussian blue sideroblastic, which is the only one that has normal iron studies thalassemia, which is the only one that has a low ferritin is iron deficiency, which is the only one that has a high RDW, the new cells get smaller and smaller, which is the only one of these that has hemoglobin H, three gene deleted alpha thalassemia. Last hard thing for this section is back to the electrophoresis. The electrophoresis tells you how much hemoglobin A do you have, which is adult hemoglobin, two alpha chains, two beta chains. How much hemoglobin F do you have? Because hemoglobin F is two alpha chains and two gamma chains. That's what goes up in beta thalassemia is the hemoglobin F. Because since you have less beta chains, you start having alpha chains hooking up with gamma chains. Since you have less beta chains, you have alpha chains hooking up with delta chains. And delta chains is hemoglobin A2. And that's how you diagnose beta thalassemia, because you have a decrease in the hemoglobin A and an increase in the fetal in A2. How do you diagnose thalassemia? Microcytic anemia normal iron studies. Microcytic anemia normal iron studies. I know I got thalassemia. Microcytic anemia normal iron studies, I get an electrophoresis. If I see an increased hemoglobin F, an increased A2, I know it's beta thalassemia. Let's jump to the easy part. There's no treatment for trait. How do you treat a tra trait? No treatment for trait. Alpha trait, no treatment. Beta trait, no treatment. Sickle trait, no treatment. There ain't no treatment for trait. How do you treat an Iron deficiency, give iron. The least efficient way is to give oral ferrous sulfate, but it's what we use, and it makes the stool black. How are you gonna know that that black stool is from iron replacement and not from more upper GI bleeding? How are you gonna know it's from iron replacement and not more upper GI bleeding? That gives you black stool. And the answer is, is that ferrous sulfate is one, not guaiac positive. Elemental iron, the element iron. Unbound iron, iron without hemoglobin, iron without myoglobin, does not make the stool heme test positive. Elemental iron is guaiac negative. The guaiac becomes positive when it's attached to proteins. Hemoglobin, myoglobin. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells. Hemoglobin, myoglobin, red blood cells. The guaiac cannot tell. Oh, can't tell if it's hemoglobin or myoglobin or red cells, but it can tell you whether it's oral ferrous sulfate. The other thing is oral ferrous sulfate is constipating. And blood is cathartic. Blood makes you poo. Why did Tigger put his head in the toilet bowl? because he was looking for poo. <laughs> yeah, I'm having a lot of children, more and more. But ferrous sulfate, oral ferrous sulfate is constipating and blood is cathartic and all vampires have diarrhea. There's no treatment for chronic disease, only erythropoietin if you have end-stage renal disease. Sideroblastic anemia, a small number of sideroblastics will get better with giving vitamin B6, with giving pyridoxine. A small number will improve because they have hereditary amino levulonic acid synthetase. That's a long word. The ALA, synthetase, amino levulonic acid synthetase, pyridoxine, small number, small number, mostly just to correct the underlying cause. Thalassemia, no treatment for trait. Thalassemia, final question. In hemoglobin electrophoresis, if you have beta thalassemia, you don't have beta chains. If you don't have beta chains, the alpha chains hook up with gamma chains, which is hemoglobin F, or with delta chains, which is hemoglobin A2. That's beta thalassemia. So you can see it on the electrophoresis. 
If you have beta-4 tetrads, you can see the hemoglobin H on the electrophoresis. Beta-4 tetrads. This is now the single hardest question in the microcytic anemia section. This is it. And if you know this question, then you're going to get a 250. You're going to get in the 99th percentile. Because ultimately, um, ultimately, we think that we're here to, as an excellence course, not adequacy. So, um, uh, you know, we're not supposed to be here just to pass. We're supposed to be here to kick ass. How do you tell that there's two gene deleted? If you can't switch to another chain because there's alpha chains and everything. You see, beta thalassemia, you could just say it's a switch. It's a switch. I switched from A to fetal. I switched from A to A2. The only way you can make this diagnosis for sure is you have to do genetic studies, genetic testing, and ultimately the only way to be able to tell do you have one gene deleted or two gene deleted is to look at the genes. So ultimately the only way to really know you have one and two gene deleted alpha thalassemia is to look at the genes, genetic testing. What will the electrophoresis show in one and two gene deleted? You're gonna get this wrong, it's very difficult for people. It's normal. The electrophoresis is normal because A, hemoglobin A will be down, A2 will be down, fetal will be down, because there's alpha chains in everything. So the electrophoresis will not show the most common alpha thalassemia. The electrophoresis will not show the most common alpha thalassemia. The electrophoresis in alpha thalassemia with two gene deleted is normal because the percentages are the same. That's hard. But I hope that you persevere and that you make it. Who has gone far? For I would go farther. Who has been bold and true? For I would be the boldest and truest being of the universe. See you in the next section.